brothers do you recall when the grasslands reach to the horizon? And the deafening roar of countless wings overhead. Back when Rome was a village at Britain, the Emerald Island. Before we gave up on our future and buried our dead. All right, guys. Hi, how's everyone doing? Okay. Good. Good. Yeah, we're traveling, so we are obviously not in the most um, professional setting right now, but nonetheless, we are ready to continue our lovely history of China. We are, I believe, are on episode 57, is it? And I named it Neolithic China. What I should have named it is Neolithic question mark China. Because last time we talked a little bit about um, prehistory of um, what we know now as a slowly forming Chinese uh, civilization. And we talked a, lot, a little bit about the Neolithic cultures in China from the um, more of, um, I, I guess, archaeological kind of scientific approach. The problem is that we talked a little bit about this in the very first episode on China, is that um, the Chinese culture, the Chinese tradition, Chinese people are aware that there is a, a scientific approach to the understanding of their history and past. But there's very much um, underlying their whole civilization, underlying the entire mentality of that region, underlying their culture, their self-identity, even as, as recent as... I don't know, some sort of children's cartoons today or TV series that are coming out that are modern detective stories. There are certain concepts, there are certain traditions, and there are certain cultural understandings, cultural ideals that need to be understood before you really can understand the mentality of the peoples as a whole, the, the history of the development of the region, and the, a lot of finer points in their history cannot be understood without understanding what the Chinese people Cumulatively, again, I'm using the word Chinese as a kind of an umbrella term because there's different uh, groups that formed that um, non-homogenous uh, population that we know today as the Chinese people and the various uh, kind of uh, regions that may or may not be included within the territories that were included in the past or have been included fairly recently, um, if you look at it on a larger scale. Um, that whole mentality and everything else formed on understanding of their origin and their history that does not always match what Western archaeology says about the region. Now, these ideas and these concepts are so fluid within the mind of an average Chinese person. Historical accuracy versus um, mythological accuracy are kind of one and the same. And oftentimes, images and concepts uh, merge into one. I'm myself, I'm kind of struggling to understand some of these concepts, not because they're hard to understand, but because they're not a part of our Western civilization, whether it's Russia or, or America, whether it's Britain or, I don't know, um, Germanic peoples. It's still kind of, we have very similar concept of what it means to be a hero, of what it means to be a fair dame, of what it means to be um, a saint, what it means to be a good ruler. All these concepts are very much kind of imbued within us. And even the cultures that got superimposed by the West, dominant Western culture today um, oftentimes have absorbed at least partially some of these concepts, some of these um, worldviews. So to us, of course, a hero is going to be mighty. It's, uh, you know, when, when you say the word hero, the first thing that people who know anything about history and mythology in the Western culture will think about a Greek, a Greek hero. When we say a good ruler, when we say, you know, fair, just king, we think of, a, a I don't know, Char Charlemagne or um, Arthur or somebody who has qualities such as a wise ruler, good administrator of the state, good warrior, leader of his men, fair judge, and so on and so forth, right? When we think about somebody being bequested with a um, gift of marrying a princess, for example, we always think of that as being um, a great honor, right? A prize. When we think of a saint, we think of a person who is kind and patient and uh, at the same time is very strong in their faith. And all of these are Judeo christianic values. A lot of it is in the European cultural basis, right? Whatever way we developed, whether it's Roman or Greek, whether it's Celt, um, whether it's Saxon, whether it's you know, any other Germanic uh, cultures, whether it's Slavic, 
there's still that, whether it's even Iranian and so forth, um, it's still that those in the European, very sub subjective cognitive concepts and uh, preconceived stereotypes in the positive sense. Well, when we start looking away from our sphere of understanding of cultures, those stereotypes are very different. And that's what I'm personally struggling with as I'm trying to understand some of these concepts. I have a question if you have a moment. I absolutely um, do. In what way do you struggle with some of these concepts? I'm a little bit curious if uh, you have a, any trouble uh, with the concept of good versus bad and how that kind of can break down in other you know, societies. No, not at all. And I'm, I'm actually quite, quite I think that I've demonstrated that I'm not quite capable of being flexible with that. It just, it is, it's, and I, I kind of run into the same problem, for example, with Mesoamerican cultures, because um, it's a good and bad is, first of all, is such a narrow um, concept that is so Judeo-Christian, really. 99% of human cultures never had such thing as good and bad or good and evil. That is a very, and even those cultures that did oftentimes understood them more as a productive versus wrong, you know, positive versus wrong rather than good and bad. I mean, the concept of sin is a very modern and very Judeo-Christianic Judeo invention. Different cultures view sin as very different sort of thing, and it operates in very different sort of ways. I think Chris can uh, very much kind of uh, vouch to that, and so I'm sure so can John. Um, I'm not sure that's not more Indo-European because of Zoroastrianism and stuff. Culture is a, it's a, an honor-shame society. So the concepts of good and evil are very, very strong. Um, and of course, we Christianity comes from that. Islam comes from that. Um, yeah, the idea of honor and shame, it's, which is kind of big. Which is not the same at all as good and bad. And again, David, it was the Zoroastrianism, for example. Um, they, they didn't necessarily, it wasn't necessarily good or bad. It was pro-human and anti-human concept. In other words, one force that fought for the success of humanity and another force that wanted to fight against the success of humanity is not necessarily the same as, you know, black and white, good and evil in Judaic, Christianic uh, sort of worldview. And in a lot of other cultures, older cultures, for example, like um, early uh, uh, Greek or Roman cultures, the idea of committing a sin was not a matter of doing something wrong for morally incorrect. Sin was when you did not predict and properly fulfill the will of the gods. So that's where the little game of not stepping on the cracks in the sidewalk, for example, comes from. A sin is not something that you do by choice. It's not a moral choice. You, if you, can, do, you can sin by accident. For example, in, Jew, in Jewish tradition, a woman who does not know that she's about to begin her period uh, three days in advance, I think it's three days, isn't it, Chris? you're not supposed to enter the temple. And if you do enter the temple, you have committed a horrific sin that was going to completely doom your entire progeny. But you don't know when your period is going to start. And so if you don't calculate it right and you come into the temple within three days of your period, you have sinned. So that has nothing to do with moral choice. It's a whole, it's more of a concept of falling down. But it's very fluid in different cultures and different ideas. So to answer your question, Ryan, it's not about that. That's not what I'm struggling with. Go ahead. Oh, sorry, I just wanted to be clear on that part, because one of the things that I found interesting about, you know, Chinese uh, peoples is that their culture does view these things a little bit differently. And I've always wondered just how much Taoism actually has influenced their overall worldview, so to speak. Taoism was a very interesting topic for me, but it does not hold to our Western values of right and wrong. So I was curious. Yeah, 99, like I said, 99% of human history, 99% of human cultures that have existed and exist today don't hold to the Western idea. Now, a lot of them have been overimposed by that. But if you don't look at the Western culture right now dominates, but it doesn't mean that it's the biggest one in, in existence. And it doesn't mean that even the most people living on this planet are necessarily subjected to the Western worldview. But that's all philosophical discussion. Um, I mean, there's still people in Africa, there are people, you know, in uh, in Amazonian regions, India, you know, a lot of other places all across the world that may not be as numerous or as bolsterous about their presence, but they are nonetheless uh, quite important and impactful. Uh, like we talked about the Caucasian cultures earlier, and their idea of good and bad is not at all necessarily aligned with the what we hold today. No, what I struggle more with is putting myself into the shoes of characters whose um, while a system of coordinates I cannot always um, be able to intuitively relate to. I'm able to relate to them on an um, intellectual level, but that intuitive um, ability to immediately, subconsciously, kind of on a in very um, 
I don't know, instinctual level, orient myself within the, the space that this person is looking at and how they're viewing reality is not, there's a little bit of a misalignment. And it's almost like when you're trying to play a shooter game, first, you know, first person shooter game in a 3D environment, and your focus is a little bit off. And so you're getting a little dizzy. I think that's the best way I can really describe it. But we've gotten off on a very philosophical <laughs> kind of a um, cosmological discussion. What I do want to talk about is uh, the fact that these um, col the, these cultures that eventually merged into what we know as China and nearby states, some of the nearby states today, again, we talked about how history is very important to them, but their history is made up of um, not just facts as we know them in late Western science, but also of mythological worldview. And in that sense, this is very similar to the biblical studies uh, archaeological school and the way the Bible has influenced the Western society. So the best uh, referential point, even though it's not the same narrative at all, but just like the biblical concepts permeate everybody's uh, worldview in the West, even if that person is completely atheist, in the same way does do these concepts permeate the Chinese uh, mentality and psyche and understanding of the world even if they are a hyper-modern, completely non-mythologically minded uh, person, even if they were communists at a certain period of time, you know, hardcore communists like in Mao's days. And it's important to know these legends and how they do and do not correlate to um, actual archaeological finds, which they oftentimes don't. But yet again, Chinese science just very much try to make them align sometimes with the archaeological facts. In the same way that biblical studies people, you know, biblical archaeology people try to align biblical facts to all the stories in the Bible with archaeological digs and so forth. So in that sense, it's no different at all. I don't really have enough, a lot of images for you guys today, because a lot of these are just stories. But like I said, again, I think they are foundational. So a lot of this mythology it came together in, as any mythology, it's messy, it's complicated. But it, a lot of it has formed from different tribes and different groups of people's individual mythological stories coming together and mixing into, melting, kind of merging into one single story, very similar to what happens in the Bible. For example, we know that there's several layers of narratives within what we know as the Bible today, especially the Old Testament. Um, the same thing happened here. And uh, most likely this was sorted through, organized, and kind of put into some sort of a logical arrangement about the time of the Shang the dynasty, somewhat censored, edited, prettified. In the same way, for example, as the Scandinavian stories, uh, the sagas were written down at a certain time. As we know, the, the biblical stories probably predate the time when they were actually committed to some sort of a written system. So when that happens, when legends that are starting to already fade out from being active and alive within a population start getting written down is when they become the canon. But at the same time, they oftentimes bear a lot of the echoes of the contra contradictions and confusions that a lot of legendary and mythological stories have. So in that sense, on the one hand, um, what we're getting is an edited and heav heavily censored uh, for political or any other reasons, and sometimes simply due to misunderstanding narrative. On the other hand, some of these narratives have echoes of such ancient concepts and beliefs that don't fit very well into what the Shang dynasty, for example, would have wanted to portray, that there's clearly some echoes of maybe, if not real events, but the real world perception, worldview of very archaic groups of peoples in that region. And it gives us a glimpse through the eyes of the ancient Chinese peoples different peoples who make up what today is the Chinese nation. And sometimes I think there's a reconciliation between different uh, groups that may have little different aspects on similar stories or whatever. Right. Right. So, but, but another thing that happened when these, uh, do, you know, when this, uh, when this information got written down is that um, even in the times of Xing dynasty, the Chinese were already very practical peoples. They were very, in a way, very scientifically minded peoples. Um, they didn't want to be writing down things that sound like fantastical fairy tales. They wanted to be writing things that look like fairly reasonable history that could be applied to real humans on, in a way. But the material that they were working with was, was oftentimes mythological fairy tale and um, kind of um, not very rational as a lot of mythological material is in the sense of um, 
everyday human life. So what they did is oftentimes they would take characters, they would take uh, creatures or um, personas that were obviously originally either deities or demons of some sorts. Uh, demons, not in the sense of evil, but more like in the sense of demons, to where they're just wild creatures. Uh, fantastical creatures and they would strip them of all these mythological and fantastical features and make them as normal as human as believable as possible again we see that happening in biblical uh, studies oftentimes especially modern day but this was happening in china very early on and uh, so on, like i said on the one hand we need to be very careful on how uh, literally we take these stories even if they sound very realistic very simple because if you start digging into the origins of some stories, suddenly where things appear, like people start having, you know, cow heads or they wind up having bird shapes or they wind up having armies of various uh, animals serving them. Somebody winds up might having, might, might, might wind up having a snake, uh, like a snake's tail. And so that's where we see that a lot of these figures are not actual human, not memories of human rulers who once upon a time ruled in those regions but they're actually mythological creatures. Does that, does that make sense? Um, I was talking to a Chinese history professor a few days ago, mm -hmm. uh, talking about a Navajo deity that symbolizes uh, duality and dynamic interaction of duality. And uh, he says, oh, that sounds like our idea of uh, cosmic uh, Taoism, you know, the idea of duality. And he says that is very ancient before like uh, cultural creations. Right. So he was thinking of that in that in that context. Absolutely, absolutely. And you know, and it's, some of these mythos are really archaic because the Chinese culture did not have the weeding out of uh, everything that does not match our new godly narrative. That uh, all the cultures that was heavily subjected to the Christian or you know or Judeo Judeo Christian Islamic influence have, and so they maintained a lot of these very archaic. Um, very openly maintain them, not not as vestiges, not as some hidden uh, around the corner old wives' tales, but very openly they might maintain these very ancient cultural echoes. So there's, uh, I'm not going to go into the cosmic creation um, kind of as much because there's several of the creation stories. Some of them very much um, echo the Scandinavian stories when uh, people basically everything the world was created from a body of a giant that got dismembered. And this body part became this, that body, part, that's pretty ancient and that belongs to all of humanity in one way or another, I think. There's another story of, I mean, there's several kind of uh, world creation stories and I don't really want to go into that. I want to go into the things that really kind of echo and inter are interwoven with actual Neolithic pre-written culture of the Chinese region. And that the Chinese themselves oftentimes mix up with factual occurrences and events. So there's two groups of stories. The first one uh, has to do with three rulers, three foundational rulers, or three foundational figures, I should say, not rulers. And then the second uh, cycle of stories, group of stories, or group of legends, has to do with the five um, very important figures. And I doubt that we're going to get through all of them today because they have quite a bit of attributes, all of them. But the closer you get, in, basically about halfway through the five, the first three are clearly mythological characters, any which way you look at them. But as you start getting through the five great rulers, the closer you get to modernity, so to speak, the more humanoid, the more human-like they get, the more anthropomorphic they become, to where the further back in time you look, the less anthropomorphic these entities are. So um, again, people say, of anybody of Chinese origin, anybody who is a specialist in China, again, I'm not a specialist in China. A lot of the stuff we're learning on the go. So if you feel like commenting, correcting us anywhere, if you might miss my spelling or pronunciation is somewhat off on some of these names, I apologize deeply. And one thing that I also ran into, and I'm sorry, this is such a wrong, long preamble, but it's kind of important. Like I have a real hard time memorizing the names and I understand that that's kind of um, not very nice, because if you're learning a culture, you should learn the people's names, but to Western ears, some of these names are very kind of difficult to process and they almost sound as a background noise. And so, and that's an issue I've ran into oftentimes when I'm trying to deal with Chinese history. So what I decided to do is with, as we talk about these characters, because I know that names sometimes are hard to memorize and they all merge into one person. I'm gonna to try to give you the name, but I'm also gonna to try to give you some sort of a defining trait about a character. So you can remember them as, a, hey, this is the guy who did this. Or this is the woman who had this kind of hair. 
so that we at least have some sort of markers in our minds to attach these names to. I think that may be a good idea. So the first group um, is a San Juan group, and that is a group that consists of several characters. Now, that's the very first important characters in the Chinese mythological histories of the peoples. The, um, the very first character, I'm reading this from a page because I don't want to mis mispronounce the stuff, is uh, Fuzi. And he also had a wife, and her name is, um, I want to make sure I'm pronouncing it correctly, it's Nua. And so they are very, very first early rulers, legendary rulers um, of China or a part, part of China. Now, these are definitely very, very archaic characters. First of all, they're represented with some of the tribu tributes of very early, um, I don't even want to say constructions. They, they're more associated with, with skills that have to do with hunting and gathering, but they also oftentimes are portrayed with triangles and other things that basically they taught people how to build very first dwellings. Um, these characters are hyper archaic for a couple of reasons. One, one of those reasons is because in earliest illustrations, they're usually portrayed as snake-like or serpent-like and having, oh, then it's kind of slowly fades into where they have snake tails to where it eventually fades into where they look totally humanoid and normal. But these are definitely mythological uh, characters because not only the Chinese uh, uh, culture, the Chinese people speaking, you know, Han speaking peoples have that um, historical character. They also, uh, these characters are also found in the surrounding tribes that are not actually from the same language group. And so that seems to be a very super archaic deity uh, pair. Um, for example, they were, and yeah, and they likely were ancient gods. I'm looking at my little notes, but um, so those two, according to legend, had to recreate the world after the world was shook up and damaged by uh, uh, another monster type character who kind of went a little rambunctious and put some holes into the heavens and uh, made the heavens start, start to tilt and fall which is when the female of the pair, um, the wife of the uh, celestial ruler, whatever you want to call her, I guess they're more of an earthly rulers. So they had to kind of uh, make sure that the sky didn't fall on earth. And for that, they picked out poor sad turtle of which they chopped up the feet and attached the feet of the turtle to the skies. And so according to that particular le legend, the heavens are still here because there's a turtle that has had a horrible amputation performed on it, which I think is not very nice, but most of those early mythos are not very nice. Um, but they also had to patch up the cracks in the heavens with various precious metals and their various precious uh, substances. And so in that sense, they didn't, they're not makers of the world, but they are remakers of the world. They saved it. They also, I believed, um, to um, create people. And according to the legend, they made out people out of golden clay, uh, golden, not in the sense that they had gold in it, but, you know, gold colored clay. And at first they were trying to make people by making each person by hand, but then they, they realized that process was just too lengthy. And so they took a length of rope and they dipped into to the clay and started spinning it. And the droplets that flew off were, each droplet became a person. And at one point in time in Chinese history, that legend was, they tried to use that legend to claim that the nobility was created by hand and the common folk were made out of the dirt drops. But that really did not take off in the Chinese culture very well, which kudos to the Chinese peoples that they were not that at least class oriented, I guess. Um, let's see. Uh, what else? They, uh, the, the wife taught the humans how to be intimate and all the, everything that had to do with the sphere of reproduction and love and male-female interact, interaction. While her husband, um, he taught uh, people, the, he's one of the many characters who apparently taught people how to acquire fire. Um, and uh, even but potentially, potentially had some, something to do with early creation of writing. Now, there's what's known as the Book of Changes, which is uh, a very archaic text in Chinese culture that is oftentimes today, is still to this day, is used to um, foretell future, and it has been throughout Chinese history. And what's interesting about this text is that it's uh, basically it's a set of signs that's made out of symbols. These are symbols that most scientists today believe of is proto-writing, not actual writing. It's a group of symbols that are arranged in several possible ways, and they kind of just go in a cycle. 
Um, this seems like as good a time as any to bring up a question, kind of uh, in regards to the uh, the snake and what you were describing earlier. Uh, does the uh, the Chinese version of the dragon kind of factor into that ancient mythos at all? Okay. No, the snake and the dragon in Chinese culture are completely different. Uh, okay. Symbols. I just know that their concept of dragons is a little bit unique to uh, Westerners because we view them as typically being evil. That's not how I am told the Chinese tend to view dragons. So can you guys see? So this right here, I don't know how to pull it up any better on Google search. But you see what, what we're looking at is just a series of uh, like potential symbols. And what the Book of Changes is, is a recombination of these symbols. So. The first three of these is associated with the very first ruler that I'm talking about. But this, this thing is something that some argue is a proto form of writing. Others claim that it is a form of um, conveying of information, of symbolic information that is not necessarily uh, writing like, and that is, was originally used only to, specifically for telling of the future uh, ceremonies. Um, there's a sad ten tendency among actual scientists who research this, who get really you know, interested in this uh, particular subject. Uh, they tend to uh, not end very well and mostly on the um, you know, insane, a um, little bit not right in the head sort of thing. There was a period of time during the 90s when the study of this particular document was extremely, extremely, extremely hip among uh, people who specialized in Chinese history and myth mythology. And that's oftentimes all they talked about during their conferences and seminars. And a lot of those scientists now are very much not, not actively researching anything anymore. Bottom line is it's something so confusing and so in intriguing and so complex that it tends to drive people mad and nobody quite figured out what it is. It is to this day actively used as a part of Chinese you know, way of telling the future and their re religious practices. So, so, but the fact that this character, you know, the character known as uh, Fu Zi is believed to possibly have been the very first um, originator of some of these symbols is a way of saying that he was the foundation. He was start all because this is very much uh, central to Chinese worldview and their culture, their mythology, their um, sacred concepts. It was um, very mathematical in appearance. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but it's also very simple. Uh, so the Hmong people I already mentioned, mentioned the Hmong people who are, are not at all the same ethnicity and not at all the same language group as the Chinese people also have mentions of these deities, which would argue that these deities is a question of who borrowed them from whom or whether or not these are deities that existed pre prior to the split. My guess it would be that it would be deities that existed prior to the split because we have similar figures in Indian uh, uh, mythology, in Babylonian mythology. The idea of snake, king, and queen is fairly ancient human concept. I think it probably predates any formation of any of those language groups, in my opinion, anyway. How about the Tibetan plateau? Do we have any evidence? I, I don't. I don't know that. that no, Tibetans are kind of. Uh, we're going to have a separate talk about the Tibetans. I don't want to offend anyone by expressing my uh, right. opinion of their origin right now, but I do believe that Tibetans uh, originally came from a whole different population, very different population. Yeah. That would point to the, this being a foundational couple in the mythos. Yeah, no, it, def it definitely would. And, and, but the, the, the problem that people, and a lot of people are arguing on that, and that's actually what a lot of scientists are kind of, uh, their point of view is, but the problem is that this never developed into anything remotely resembling what we would recognize as writing today. Um, it, it remains purely symbolic and purely mythical, magical sort of form of communication. Even runes eventually, you know, uh, Scandinavian runes, they turned into something that is much more resembles writing than the system did. Ish. Ish, but still, even that is far closer to writing than this system is, if that makes sense at all. This is more like, I don't know, chess pieces or uh, magical symbols uh, like tarot cards, that kind of thing. It's closer to that. But um, so there is a mausoleum uh, burial place of this um, mythological ruler that always has existed in China. Then it got lost, then it got refounded again. But um, this is a place where Chinese peoples always have celebrated and still to this day celebrate. Uh, fertility rights, and when I mean fertility, I don't mean fornication, I mean fertility of the land, fertility of the cattle, and so on and so forth, and also various uh, rituals that bring on the rains. Um, 
And it's interesting whether today when the Chinese people are participating in this rites, whether or not they actually believe that they're participating in an ancient rain, kind of rain ritual con that's continuation from all those time from all that time long ago, or whether it's more kind of a modern day, you know, uh, reenactment. Um, it's somewhere in between, you know, the old cult, which really has been lost and could have not, not been lost just due to the length of time and kind of reenactment festival. But bottom line is it's an important cultural part of what Chinese tradition. Um, there's a third character in this little group of people, and that's the first three. Um, and the, the way that this person's name is pronounced is Sheng Nun. And that is the heavenly flower, the heavenly, um, how would you say it? Um, I can't figure out a way of, way of saying it better than that. Uh, celestial flower or the first flower in other words, this is likely was an agricultural uh, deity. He is depicted very interestingly. Um, early depictions of him, he looks like a manatar. He literally looks like, like a manatar. He looks like a man with a bull's head, with uh, bull's uh, horns. And uh, he always was a plow. In later depiction, especially in the Shang version of the story, when they kind of went through and made that much more anthropomorphic, they said he's portrayed in a hat with two horns and or he it's said that he had bumps on his head they had some sort of skull deformity because of course no educated you know shank scribe would ever believe that um somebody who was like basically half man half cow could possibly exist but this bull-like appearance very much harkens to very ancient very early um agricultural tradition when and also it is definitely more of a uh, the Han tradition to where it's less related to rice and more related to the planting of uh, grains of some sorts. But it is a Manatar type character and uh, he is very important. Uh, he's also always depicted with a shovel, the two-pronged shovel that the Chinese peasants up until very late used to plow their fields with. Um, so he was supposed to be another character that potentially taught people's fire but he also taught people the, the harvesting of grains. And uh, yeah, and he was early really depicted more like a Manatar type character. So that kind of idea of a bullheaded human is a very archaic. And again, I think that's, a, that's an idea that probably predates the split of everything that we know today split, even the Indo-European and the, I mean, it's probably a fairly old image because the Taurus or the Auroch was so important to human culture throughout its early inception. I'm gonna stop and see if anybody has anything else to say. Anybody? So just to go over the three first foundational characters, we have the very first ruler and his wife. They fixed the, the planet, I mean, they fixed the heavens when the heavens broke. They are pair and they have uh, serpentine characteristics. And also within that uh, three, character group is the very first deity, most likely deity really, that a cultural kind of hero deity character that represents the art of plowing the earth and planting grain and the advent of agriculture. So now we are, whoa, would that go from here? Sorry, I just completed. Ah, okay. Can go I make ahead. a quick. Go ahead. Um, it just my impression here is that to me, Chinese early Chinese Neolithic is kind of a combination between a millet, a millet, hog, and chicken. Uh, kind of subsistence and the from the north with a lot of influence from the ste early steppe peoples and then the south you had the uh, the rice which they found rice going back seven eight thousand years BC what we would call BC in Thailand and so you're getting that marriage of of those two throughout Chinese history, really. Right, right. And again, uh, you know, we talked about it quite a, quite a bit last time. Um, so yeah, you're you're absolutely right on that. 
Um, and a couple other functions of this other of this the character that I was talking about, the Minotaur, the plow, you know, the early agricultural the deity, is that he had another interesting has another interesting function. He was believed to have had uh, a belly or guts that were made of basically indestruct indestructible substance, um, nephrite or I think is nephrite the same thing as jade? Does anybody know? It's close. Okay, but with nephrite, basically, it said that he had nephrite gut, and so he went about tasting everything that he came across. I mean, by everything, I don't mean people. I mean, he would try all the herbs and all the substances he would come across, and he, according to legend, he also kind of made up a list of people, what, what is harmful and what is good for people. Basically, he used himself as his own guinea pig, and so... Some even today claim that the use of medicinal tea and the medicinal properties of tea in Chinese culture actually date back to the, those times, but that's not actually true archaeologically because the tea was a fairly new arrival uh, within the context of culture. That's um, an interesting story, I have to admit. The ultimate poison tester. Well, and he ended his life uh, somewhere in the south area of China, which I think the whole south thing is interesting to what David was just saying about that split between the north and the south, that he meandered off into the wildernesses of south and found some grass that finally even his super tough belly could not digest and just died. But I suspect that this is a North legend rather because a, this, we're talking about a character who is more about uh, grains than is about rice as we yeah. South was more and the bovine that. thing. Yes. Right. And uh, the bovine thing. The other thing is the fact that he dies in the South to me, it shows that that's a North legend that looks at the South as slightly other and hostile land, but that's just my kind of educated guess. Now, there's another character. There's this, typically, this is a triad, but there's actually a fourth character that is very little mentioned and mostly forgotten, but extremely interesting for us, I think. It is a very rare um, Chinese version of Prometheus. Not only did he bring fire to the people, but there's another little detail to the story. So according to the legend, humans before, before this new character came, and this character's name is um, Sao Zen. Um, he found humanity in very sad and pathetic state. Humans were living in nests on the trees. They ate raw fruits and meat. They did not know cooking. They did not know anything of civilization. And so this cultural hero, who is now mostly forgotten, supposedly had brought fire to humans, taught them how to cook food, how to build houses on the ground, and basically turned them from apes to humans, which is a very interesting um, character. Um, now, he's oftentimes depicted as a fire-making tool, and the scientists are having a little bit of a hard time defining what exactly that tool may be. What it most looks like, uh, and I don't know the technical term for it, but you know when they have a special bow with a little stick that turns in the center, and they, when, as you go back and forth, uh, the stick creates friction, and it turns, basically it, it ignites a spark. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? Yeah, that's an old uh, Boy Scout trick, so to speak. So right. fire, fire drill. Fire drill, thank you. Well, that particular instrument as actually was not, it was known in, the, in that region, you know, and historically and archaeologically, but it was very rarely used. So where did this, this particular character from is a bit of a uh, kind of a mystery among modern day scientists. Um, because it seems to be, it seems that to be an echo of some tribe or some group of some in, included population that was not very widespread. But the idea, and some scientists even argue that this whole idea that, oh, that's an ancestral memory of how humans, you know, used to be apes and then came down off the trees and became civilized. Um, modern Western scientists at least claim that that's not, of course, the case, that, of course, that um, this is more later Chinese, you know, wise men extrapol extrapolating into the past. I don't know. I think there's something tantalizing in that character, especially with that whole story of living in tree nests. Um, it definitely kind of has a little bit of an echo of um, evolutionary, and if not memory, then maybe re reconstruction. What do you guys think? I can't say much about the uh, story in terms of the plot line, but one of the things that I've always admired about uh, the culture of Chinese people is that they are not only pragmatic, they are very observant. So if somebody picks up something useful, other people will probably pick it up as well. Yeah, I'm kind of looking for the duality in the story because... From from my cultural perspective, everything is yin yang, male and female. If there's going to be a male aspect, there's got to be a female aspect somewhere. But that's what's weird. That's not always the case in this culture. 
oftentimes it's not the case at all. There's actually very few female aspects. And when there's female aspects, oftentimes they act not as a part of duality, but as their own sort of thing. I think the, the duality idea is, is pretty common in East Asian cultures. I think of like the, the yin and yang symbol in Korea, which is very strong. Um, it's not necessarily male, female, but they're two opposites of the same thing, basically. It seems to me like in these very early mythos, that's not a factor yet. At least that's my impression because I have not been able to find it. Now, again, I don't have any depth knowledge of this mythos. This is fairly new information for me to... Sorry, go ahead. Springs, uh, springs to mind is as a bringer of fire or whatever, and the lack of fire bows, or fire drills. In monsoon conditions in the South those might not be as effective as they are in other places. It might point to the na Naim, is that, am I saying it correctly? The Southern tribes that were of many different peoples that Hmong, Hmong, Hmong being not, one of them, yeah. some of those more ancient peoples from the South that a, a fire drill might not do you as much good, especially when it drain in for six months straight. Right. I had a question about uh, how late a lot of the uh, cultural developments that we typically associate with the cultures actually are, like the uh, figure, uh, how do you pronounce his name, uh, Lao Tzu? Um, no, those are actually really late. Okay, that's. I thought it was pretty much later on, I just wanted to make sure. Yeah, and the, the whole yin-yang idea, all of that is really, really late in Chinese history. Um, all those concepts did not come um until much 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 later so a lot of the things like a lot of the things that we associate with china what we're talking about is way predates any of these things it, it's way before Taoism. it's way before uh any any isms any uh any this is before even the xia dynasty this is really really archaic and so some believe that it's cultural memory of prehistoric times almost or at least pre-written times others believe that it's cultural memory of the cultural memory of the mythology of the prehistoric pre right. times. but what, whatever it is it exists and it came from somewhere it does not just come out from nothing right so um on the dating like i say you can go back six sixty eight thousand years before present and that's the neolithic uh, by 3000 BC, you're starting to see some metal work, mostly from the Altai. Most of those religious kind of, um, or not necessarily philosophical kind of things, come in from in the after 1000 BC. Yeah. A lot of these mythos don't have any mention of iron. They don't have any mention of metal of any kind. For example, some of these characters, they really uh, seem to have quite clearly described as having tools that are not Bronze Age tools, that are pre-Bronze Age. And I think we're going to stop at this group of four deities, really, because we have, we're running out of time. And that once we start the next five sacred rulers, that's a whole long, long story. But it seems to, to me that, it, in a sense, this may... This, mythology, cultural memory may reflect some sort of vague mythologization, mythologization, making up words as I go, but uh, that it seems to be um, kind of echoes of how the people went from hunting and gathering to agriculture. Um, what's interesting, and I think I've mentioned, mentioned it during our last conversation, is that there is not any mythological or otherwise stories about the taming of animals, uh, domestication of animals at all in Chinese culture, to where it almost seems like, like there's there are stories about the first agrarian cultural hero, but there is not um, a story about how the first animals were tamed. For some reason, the Chinese historians deemed that to be very unimportant early on and never really talked about it. They will have a different attitude towards animals than we do. Like there's no animal cruelty laws in modern China, for example. They treat animals completely differently than the way we think of them. And we do know archaeologically that uh, pigs were domesticated Pretty early, six thousand. Uh, Multiple times. Chickens, actually. chickens. Times. Uh, yeah, and chickens became very important very early. So this this is the early depiction of the pussy and his spouse, and you can see they're very snake-like, very serpent-like. To where this is much later depiction of pussy, where he does not look snake-like at all. He looks very much like a your typical, um, you know, early barbarian type wise man. Uh, here is 
other depictions of similar deities. And again, you can see that they are not very, um, on the one hand here, they still look very much like snakes, right? Very, very serpentine depiction of the wife, very serpentine. This is a, sorry, and I'm gonna directly quote this lecture because his name is Sergei Dmitriev. Um, this is really funny comment that he made about, so they lost the mausoleum of the wife of Fuzi, and then they decided to rebuild that mausoleum. And now it's rebuilt and uh, in that it's a big park and in that mausoleum stands the statue right here, which he claims to be a uh, mix between, you know, a, a hentai anime and, mother, you know, mother homeland is calling upon you. This is another depiction of the Book of Change. Uh, those are the basic symbols and you see how they just recombination of the same sticks. So the very early version of this Book of Symbols, I mean, it's a Book of Change, I'm sorry, Book of Change is that you see, so you have basically, you have either one straight stick or stick was a, was a space in it, right? Or a line or a line was a space. Was it? And then you, this is a way that you recombine, can recombine them in different ways. And so that's the very early form of what we're talking about. So basically you have, so that's what I mean about this is a way before any proto writing, even this is symbolic representation of something. We don't know what, but it's it almost looks like a mathematical proof. That's mm -hmm. just what it looks like. Yeah, geneticists, biologists, um, um, computer programmers, linguists, mathematicians have all kind of gone crazy. Anybody who tries to study this in depth tends to not end well that way. But it is, it's very mathematical. So, okay, so this is our um, depiction of our first uh, flower or, uh, you know, our, our agricultural god. And you see where later on he's portrayed as having just a skull defect or sometimes is wearing a funny hat. But here you see early on, he's a, again, this is almost portrayed like a head, but his early depictions are very much Minotaur like, and that's the two pronged shovel they oftentimes used to work their land even pretty late into uh, heck, even 19th century. Uh, pe poor peasants oftentimes would use that. Um, this is the cultural hero that I was talking about, the one that's nearly forgotten, the one that supposedly taught people how to come down of the trees. And yes, this is a real Chinese illustration. I know it looks very modern, but really that's how it was depicted. And that's the, their Prometheus type character who took them down and uh, off the trees and showed them how to live on a land. And uh, that's uh, Sao Zhen. And so that it seems to me that this cultural hero may have come from a whole different uh, paradigm from another tri from a tribe that was kind of very different from the majority of the Chinese population. So what I suspect is most likely this, my guess, again, don't quote me on this. I suspect that there was, um, you know, the, that we're looking at three different uh, theological um, mythological traditions altogether within this, what they call the Holy Triad, even though it's four characters. So the, the snake gods, probably is one cultural tradition entirely. Uh, the, the agricultural god, the, the Minotaur man, is another different, uh, probably came from a slightly different region, agricultural tradition, because that one clearly is a Norse deity, right? Or a Norse character, at least. But the serpentine uh, creatures, you know, um, there was even some um, Jesuits used to believe that, that with the Book of Change, that it was a form, it was something that the Chinese developed to be able to to uh, communicate with the proto-Babylonian type population. Um, and again, there's the snake gods are part of the Sumerian and Babylonian tradition. So all of that, I think is a little bit interwoven and probably goes pretty far back in the past. In the past. So I think that those are three different traditions. Then, and then we have this uh, character, hold on, where, where is he? The barbarian character. Um, the Prometheus type character. And he is, again, we have such different styles of depiction, such different almost um, worldviews and psychological approaches to these um, characters that I'm, I'm thinking that they, we're talking about three different traditions from three different groups. What do you guys think about that? What we call China today, there's, um, I mean, there's all kinds of languages just from that one country. And you think of all the other areas around there, there were definitely more than one people there. Absolutely. No. And that's what I'm saying. It seems to me like it's a lot like early biblical stories when you clearly have at least two, at least two very early um, foundational traditions, you know, uh, kind of creation stories merged together. Well, I think that here we have very similar many. situation. I think you have many because you're talking about all those groups from the South. You're talking about... Uh, 
the millet civilization in the north, you're talking about the Tibetan plateau. And like you were talking about the snake peoples, uh, I know in India you have cities that have cobra to this day have their cobra festivals where cobras are brought into the city. And, and yeah. you're thinking about a lot of different cultural traditions. What stands out in that last oh, representation oh, yeah. to me is, yes, I think you are talking about some memory of transformation from hunting and gathering into agriculture and and so on. But the cows in the corner of that picture tell me they're that because we do know that they were first domesticated off the step. So you're seeing almost a transition there too. Right. No, no, no. But uh, uh, you're absolutely right. There was a multitude, uh, both of you are absolutely right. There was a multitude of many small and large different fluid tribes there. But I think that over time, certain stories within certain, like within each time period, within each region would dominate uh, and kind of run right. over other stories. And then it crystallized to where just a couple of them are now visible to us, right. you know, looking into the past, especially considering that first the Shang and then everybody and their dog or their lack of a dog in some cases went through and... Uh, yeah. And the queen especially. Like, yeah, so. Isn't it a little bit interesting as well, the uh, people right above those two animals in that depiction, the way that they were kind of bowing down as they were uh, presumably walking. I don't know if we have a translation of the uh, writing in that I, or not, but it's interesting how they're positioned to me. It is. Yeah. Not to mention the fact that, that the cattle look very Indian sacred. Again, um, the lecture. Uh, quick quick Go ahead. question: Do we do we know the vintage um, of this of this uh, artwork? Uh, right. the, 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 okay, I don't know the actual vintage of this artwork because I don't speak Chinese, but I could ask my Chinese colleague to take a look at it. But I know that the lecturer who's uh, showing it, he says, "quote unquote," he says, "Yes, this is an older depiction, but it certainly looks like something out of Soviet era cartoons of our barbarians." Mm -hmm. Well, what's interesting about it is that so many of the characters are portrayed in artistically are portrayed in perspective, which is right. very unique. I'm pretty sure right. that this is a fairly modern representation. Probably. That's probably 20th, if not 21st century. I mean, um, but it is a, an artist's attempt to depict the concept uh, in a way that modern people will perceive it. That's, I'm pretty sure that this is a fairly modern uh, depiction. Moreover, I can even tell you which cartoon has strongly influenced it here. Yeah, I, I still tend to see duality in like the, the serpents, the male and female serpents. And, right. And that I think you know, because that's really old, but then as you evolve into the present, everything becomes more male contextual. You know, there's no female, but I, I, I think it's an evolution of duality between male and female to where it's only becoming male but still i i, I kind of see a duality even in the the guy with the, you know the two spades you know the shovel with the two spades and the two horns um, does this look yeah. a little familiar guys yeah yes that's what but so like i said i'm fairly sure that this is mogli by the way this is the jungle book the soviet canadian cartoon i forget what year it is 70 something but very similar representation of uh, art, artwork. So it's, it's a modern Chinese, um, you know, illustrators trying to, call, especially like if you look at the buffalo, the way they're portrayed, very similar. Uh, but, but the bottom line is it's a modern school of uh, thinking, uh, but applied to an archaic mythos. So, but, but the fact that even the fact that the modern uh, Chinese illustrator would think of that as a, you know, that's the image that he would be his go-to or her go-to image in her, his or her head when they are trying to depict that ancient mythos is pretty telling because obviously that's their modern worldview overlapping over that ancient uh, concept. Right. I think we're pretty much out of time, guys. I really would like to at least start on the, um, the five, you know, celestial rulers or whatever you want to call them, the five great ones, because that's a little bit closer to the modern these mythos is hyper archaics that we talked about today, but the ones we're going to talk about next time are the ones that a lot of people try to correlate to actual dynasties and so forth. Um, and that's the Yellow Emperor and his progeny, and sometimes not his progeny. 
but uh, uh, just just a very brief story. Go ahead. Um, and when when you spoke of the uh, the legend of the tortoise mm-hmm. and using the tortoise to recreate the the heavens, mm-hmm. in my time in um, there is one particular time in Africa in Uganda, and it was explained to me that the tortoise uh, governed the rains and governed the heavens. And we had been uh, going down this one particular uh, road. Uh, it wasn't even a road. It was just a dirt two track. Mm-hmm. And we came across a tortoise. And uh, the fellow that I was with, uh, he uh, captured the tortoise and put it in the back of the truck. And uh, the crew uh, warned of great forgivings and said, oh, within half an hour, a storm had had, uh, um, gathered overhead, and we were in perpetual rainfall. Good. I'm glad. Good, good. In Uganda. Yes. Good, good. Don't mess with tortoises. Yeah. And um, so, anyways, (laughs) the... This became quite the um, quite the scandal in camp, and we uh, we we orchestrated the escape of the tortoise. And lo <laughs> and behold, when the tortoise escaped, uh, the rain stopped. I believe it. It stopped. It was amazing. I have a do- own a tortoise that I'm par- rather partial to, so that's why I don't like people doing mean things to tortoises. But maybe that's my whole the difficulty with the Chinese culture. I wouldn't be surprised. Yeah. <laughs> I enjoyed that story very much. Thank you. Thank you. That was awesome. Yes, guys. That was good. Okay, guys. Thank you. So good to see everyone. Everybody be well. Bye. Right. Yeah, you right, too. You guys take care. Take care. Good to see you, John. Bye. All right. That exist within every man's soul And we will live forever Or as long as stories are told